Hi and welcome back to the channel. Who doesn't like Hammer horror films? If you don't, then this is probably not the video for you, but I've got three second tier Hammer horror films that I've watched recently that are kind of interesting. The first one's really interesting. The second one's kind of interesting. The third one's more than kind of interesting. So I'm going top, bottom, middle on these three reviews. You're going to get a bit of Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, so don't worry about that. But these movies, I was, I was looking through the shelves on the hammer I have on DVD because I don't have a lot on Blu-ray. Oh, actually, I do have a lot on Blu-ray. But I went to the DVD shelf first. I probably got some of these on Blu-ray, but I didn't watch them on Blu-ray, which is... I'm going to deal with that later. Anyway, the first of the three movies is from about 1960, 1961. It was directed by Terence Fisher, the guy who gave us all of the classic Mummy and um, Dracula and Frankenstein movies in the late 1950s from Hammer. Um, it doesn't star... Well, it kind of does star one of the big two of Hammer horror films. But the main star of it's a Canadian actor who didn't go on to do too much else after this. But before I get ahead of myself, I'm going to show you the uh, Mill Creek box set that I've got. It was kind of a box set of the Hammer Horror Films. It's prosaically named Hammer Films Collection. And in it we've got Scream of Fear, The Gorgon, which is the second movie I'm going to talk about, Stop Me Before I Kill, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, and the movie I'm going to talk about now, The Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll, which was written by Wolf Mankiewicz, who also wrote a whole bunch of other interesting movies around this time, including the really interesting Lawrence Harvey movie, Expresso Bongo, which if you haven't seen it, you really should. It's Wolf Mankiewicz's script for this movie that lifts it above what it might have been otherwise. In the movie, Canadian actor Paul Massey plays Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, who are uh, kind of, it's a bit of a different take on things. In 1959, Hammer did a black and white comedy version of Jekyll and Hyde set in modern times called The Ugly Duckling with Bernard Breslau in it. But this one takes the same conceit based on Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And in that Dr. Jekyll is older and hairier and not very good looking. Whereas Mr. Hyde is younger, vital, passionate, horny, and totally amoral. So you don't get the bestial Mr. Hyde. You get evil hiding under a beautiful guise. And that kind of makes it a lot more interesting. So of course, Jerry Lewis stole the idea of the ugly duckling for the nutty professor, though that was never acknowledged. So in this one, you've got Dr. Jekyll, a saintly scientist who neglects his wife Kitty, played wonderfully by Maud Adams who is really good in this film. I think she gives it exactly what it needs. She's doing the same kind of role that Hazel Cord and Barbara Shelley did in other Hammer films. Kitty is beautiful, vivacious, younger, and having an affair with a guy called Paul Allen, who is one of Dr. Jekyll's friends. Paul Allen, the tall, aristocratic, good-looking, kind of amoral character, is played by Christopher Lee. You're too good to me, Kitty. I am. Far too good. I won't ever put you in this position again, believe me. I don't want you to lie for me. Of course you don't. I don't deserve you, Kitty. You don't. Playing a kind of caddish romantic lead. And he's really good in this one. He gets to do a few different things. He gets to play the cad. He gets to play the loyal friend who's not really loyal. And he gets a scene where he is drunk. Now, you don't see many scenes of Christopher Lee in movies playing drunk, but he does it quite well. He's got just the right level of drunkenness. Drunk is hard to play for actors. You've got to kind of not go too far over the top, otherwise it becomes obvious that you're acting, and you can't underplay it. You've got to have, be larger slightly to do it, and I think Christopher Lee does a good job on that. Dr. Jekyll, of course, takes his potion, which is supposed to deal with the duality of human nature, the good and evil which is more a Christian religious concept than an actual fact of biology. And Wolf Mankiewicz's script is interesting and sly in that it kind of has aspects of Dr. Jekyll, his neglect of his wife, his monomaniacal passion for his work, which is a fairly negative trait, 
and Mr. Hyde, who is very much interested in women and gives Kitty the attention that she doesn't want because she's, she's in love with Paul. She doesn't want this new man, Edward Hyde, coming into her life, even though he's her husband. And the movie gets into some very kind of murky moral grounds here in, in the best possible way. Hyde very soon finds out that Kitty and Paul are having an affair. He sees them in a nightclub. And so him remembering that he's also Dr. Jekyll decides to play a long con on both of the adulterous couple. The nightclub's pretty cool too. It's um, a really nice piece of production design and uh, Terence Fisher films it beautifully. You've got an exotic dancer who dances with a python. And there's some really interesting moments with that python which were cut out of some prints of the film for their suggestiveness. But for around the early 1960s, very early 1960s, it was quite audacious to show that in any kind of mainstream movie. And while I'm on the production design, I like the production design of Dr. Jekyll's lab, which is in kind of an out, outer shed of his house. Uh, it's really good. It's got books and, and a kind of office area, study area up one end, and all the lab stuff down the other. It's a well thought out little... Um, piece of production design. I like it. The production design in this is pretty good. And I was thinking about this and I'm going to digress just for a moment. When you think, oh, how good was it that they could find all of those Victorian and Edwardian things to put into all these 1960s Hammer horror films. And then it occurred to me that the 1960s and the early part of the 20th century were as far apart as the 1960s and now are. So when people are making a movie like Last Night in Soho, where they've got to get a lot of 1960s props, they had the same problem that people in the 1960s had getting Edwardian and Victorian props. They had to find things that were 60 years old. So just looking at that time span and the difference between those times blew my mind a little bit. But I'm digressing, as I said. The interesting thing that Paul Massey does well with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is he does portray Hyde in a morally ambiguous way. Uh, he is good looking. He appears to be generous to Paul when Paul has some financial problems. He does seem enthusiastic about the world. He's kind of engaged with the world in exactly the opposite way that the reclusive Dr. Jekyll is not. So Mankiewicz's script gives us that duality of the character as much as it does a duality of good and evil. Um, Paul takes Hyde to various places, kind of working class pubs, he takes him to a, a bare knuckle boxing match. He takes him to a Chinese opium den. All the fun things were available to people at the time. I like the depth that that script goes to in going, okay, what are the character traits of Dr. Jekyll? What are the opposite traits of Mr. Hyde? It's a subtler movie than I thought it was the first time I watched it. And re-watching it now, I can really appreciate that. I like Dawn Adams playing Kitty the Wife. She does give it that kind of gloss of, of class but passion as well and like every kind of upper class person in a hammer horror film it's kind of interesting to just listen to the received pronunciation the kind of stagey accent that everybody uses in british films up to this day they're unless they're working class characters or they're characters with a regional accent that received pronunciation has been a part of british cinema for 70 or 80 years that kind of posh receive pronunciation which isn't exactly like people really speak they don't speak the way boris johnson speaks for instance they don't speak the way that the windsor family speaks but there's a kind of posh cinematic and theatrical accent that the british have been using for a very long time now and it was kind of interesting just listening to all of these movies with an awareness of that so i'm leaving that aside that's just a, another aside because i'm dithering a lot here in the nightclub scenes you also get a bouncer slash pimp who when mr hyde is rude to one of the girls has a go at him and, and tries to beat him up the character playing that character is oliver reed just before he did curse of the werewolf for hammer and it was really nice to see, see oliver reed early in his career playing that kind of brutish good looking guy but just to sum it up the two faces of dr jekyll is a movie you should check out because it is 
Um, it's a story we've heard a, a hundred times before, but I think it's a story that's told well and told with enough difference to make it worth your time. It's a little bit of a second tier hidden gem of Hammer. The second movie I've got for you is from 1964 and it was also directed by Terence Fisher and it is The Gorgon. Now the problems with The Gorgon are a few. I'll tell you what they are right up from. First off, it seems like the budget was pretty low on this one. It was filmed at Bray Studios, which was Hammer's own studio on the banks of the Thames. And it looks at it. It's got very limited um, location shots and there are some bits when you can tell it's very much shot on a studio. The other problem is the script. Now the story itself isn't too bad. It's about a Gorgon terrorizing a small Bavarian town at the beginning of the 20th century and turning people to stone. That's pretty much the, the plot. But here's the problem. The, first, the viewpoint character is the problem. At first you think it's a young artist who has a fiance who's pregnant and he's getting her to do a little bit of saucy nude modeling while he paints her pictures. But it's not him because he gets killed by the Gorgon. His father comes to investigate and starts getting involved with things and the townspeople don't like him because he's sticking his nose in where it doesn't belong. And he gets killed by the Gorgon too. And it's only after that that we get to the viewpoint character, the protagonist of the movie. A guy called Paul, who's played by Richard Pascoe. And um, he is a bit of a wishy-washy character, to be really honest. I don't think that that Richard Pascoe gave it what it needed. I don't think the character was particularly well written either. But in the village, there's a um, scientist kind of doctor called Dr. Nemiroff, who has a beautiful assistant called Carla. Nemiroff is played by Peter Cushing doing kind of a second tier role in this one. And the beautiful Carla is played by Barbara Shelley and she is particularly beautiful in this movie and does a really nice job of the character as well. Again, like a lot of Hammer characters, it's a bit of an underwritten role. As the deaths mount up, we meet the local copper, Inspector Kenoff, played by Patrick Troughton, who did some other things in the 1960s of which people are very fond. And we get him um, turning up in a Bavarian policeman's pickle hole hat and not doing too much investigation. It's very much a thing where the locals don't want to talk about what's actually happening in the area. And uh, they will actively act against anybody who tries to investigate it. But our hero Paul, having lost his father and his brother to this monster, decides to investigate further. And about halfway through the film, maybe three quarters of the way through the film, his mentor shows up. Professor Meinster is the name of the mentor, and he is played by Christopher Lee, playing an older gentleman. He's got a grey wig on, he's got a big moustache, and he's playing older than his age. And he kind of lifts things up because he's playing almost like a Sherlock Holmes kind of character, investigating what's going down in the town. Peter Cushing isn't really bringing his A-game to this one for whatever reason. And his character, who... He is kind of enamored of Carla and very protective of her. She was found a number of years ago in the local area, somewhat amnesiac, and she does have memory lapses once a month during the full moon. So it doesn't take Basil Rathbone to figure out that she's something to do with the monster. The evocation of Megara the Gorgon when she does show up is kind of sketchy. I don't think they had the special effects budget to do it well. But I kind of like the fact that it's not done well. You've got the snakes in the hair thing, which is done kind of dodgily. The makeup, when it shows in close-up, is not particularly well done. And the decapitation is a little bit laughable. But there's a certain charm to this one as well. It's very much a by-the-books hammer horror film in that it's about strange goings-on, investigating the strange goings-on, finding the monster and killing it. Given that template, which is common to many, many Hammer horror films, it does an okay job. It doesn't do a fantastic job. I don't think it's anywhere near the top tier of Hammer horror films. But I like Christopher Lee playing kind of a secondary character almost, but doing it interestingly. I like Barbara Shelley a lot in this one. 
It's almost comfort viewing in a way. It delivers on its premise. It doesn't do things particularly well. You got the little bits with the character actors like Patrick Troughton. The Doctor, played by Peter Cushing, has a henchman, played by Jack Watson, who's a well-known face in 1960s and 1970s English cinema. And it's, it was kind of fun to revisit. I don't think I want to revisit it again for a while. But it's a very much by the books hammer programmer. But that brings us to the third movie, which is a lot of fun and is just that little bit different. It's from 1971. It was directed by Peter Sasty, and it is Hands of the Ripper, which is a very different kettle of fish to the 1960s Hammer films in that it's a little more explicit with some nudity and also uh, some of the violence is very shocking. Now Hands of the Ripper I got in an Australian box set by I think a now defunct company called MRA which is called Hammer Horror Collection because nobody had any imagination back in the 2000s. In this one, we've got uh, The Vampire Circus. I've got a better copy of that now, so I'm not sure why I'm keeping this one. We've got Twins of Evil as well, which is a lot of fun. That's, uh, I think, the third movie in the Karnstein trilogy that Hammer did. And Hands of the Ripper, which stars Eric Porter as a scientist, uh, Dr. Pritchard, who's a bit of a psychoanalyst, who finds a young woman working for a fake psychic doing seances played by Dora Bryan Mrs. Golding the psychic is played by Dora Bryan and who is messed up now Pritchard the doctor is a dodgy as character he uh he has a, a son and the blind future daughter-in-law Laura played by Jane Merrow invite the young woman Anna played by Angara Reese, and Anna saw her father, Jack the Ripper, killed her mother when she was a very small child in her crib. This has messed her up big time and she kind of hears and sees her father at times of stress whenever anybody shows her any kind of affection. This does not end well. Uh, she goes into a fugue state and becomes maniacally strong when somebody does show affection to her. Which is fair enough, I suppose. No means no, but you don't really need to skewer somebody to a door with a fireplace poker to say no. And uh, Anna has a problem with that. Now, Agatha Reese, interesting actress. She, she was in the TV series of Poldark and was very popular in that in the 1970s. And she plays the 17-year-old quite well. She was quite young herself at the time, of course. But um, her Anna is almost a sympathetic character in some way she is very much a victim of her circumstances and of her illness and the movie does give us a little bit of that complexity but the main focus is on Eric Porter's character Dr Pritchard now Eric Porter was in another Hammer movie which is totally wild The Lost Continent but in this one he's playing an Edwardian doctor is let's say not a moral person when Anna's death count starts mounting he hides the body of his own maid. Um, there's an implication that he chopped her up and for some reason and did something with her body, but you don't get to see what. And he is fascinated with her and what that's going to do with his career as a psychiatrist. So there's an amorality and a kind of monomaniacal focus that uh, Pritchard has, which we see then develops into a different feeling towards young Anna. Any rich middle-aged guy in the Victorian and Edwardian era was a sleazy bastard. We all know that from every movie and probably from history as well. Eric Port is good in the role and the movie also has a really nice look about it because it was filmed on the Baker Street set that had been used the year before for Billy Wilder's The Secret Life of Sherlock Holmes with Robert Stevenson. So you've got some really high production values for a Hammer film in this one. The sets are really great. The production design, the bits and pieces in houses are, are great. The costuming is great. The gore special effects are particularly well done and are quite confronting. And there is a really kind of awful scene where one of the characters has been skewered by a saber and has to find a way to get the saber out of his body. 
so that he can go and rescue other people. And that is filmed really well. I really like the way it's done in this one. Um, the movie has a great climax in the Dome of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Though it wasn't filmed there, they weren't able to get permission to film inside the Dome, so they had to do it as a set. But it looks good enough to work on that. And yeah, for me it worked. I, I liked it a lot. I liked it better than the first few times I've seen it. I've seen it like three times now. And the third time, I could really see what they were shooting for and giving us a little bit of that kind of underbelly of Edwardian society and the way that um, men of privilege looked after one another if there was an advantage to them in doing so is on display in this one. It, and like I said, it's not A-grade Hammer Horror. It doesn't have the audacity of some of the 1970s Dracula films, for instance. But it's a good, solid little horror flick and it ends as one would expect it to end with the monster being killed. Though, whether the monster is Pritchard or whether the monster is Anna with her kind of hulking out whenever she gets um, any affection shown to her, I'll leave that up to you to decide. But they're great. So, just to summarize the three movies Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll, best script, best production design, best everything, including Christopher Lee in a slightly atypical role. Second one, The Gorgon, is kind of good popcorn fun. And the third one has surprising gore effects. It has some good actors. Eric Porter is quite good playing Pritchard. And Angara Dries is, is really good as well. Um, yeah, the, watching the three of them is, was fun. It was a good way of going, yes, Hammer isn't just about Frankenstein and Dracula and the Mummy. It did try to tell other stories, and it did a pretty good job of them for the most part. In the future, I may well dive into some more Hammer as well, because I really enjoyed watching them, and I like seeing the same sets used over and over again at Bray Studios. I like the uh, character actors in the background. Hands of the Ripper. There are a lot of ladies of the night in this one. The, you see them all over the place in this movie. It's like they went, OK, we need tarts for extras. Who can we get to play Edwardian tarts? And you end up with like 20 of them on screen at one time in one of the scenes. It's, it's just crazy and it's very 1970s in that area. But yeah, it was fun to watch these three. I recommend that you do. Just be aware that the Gorgon is probably the lesser of the three, but you'll have fun with all of them regardless. And I believe the Gorgon may well be on Tubi at the moment. So anyway, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. You can also support the channel at patreon.com slash paleocinema. So anyway, look after yourself. Stay safe. Stay well. Stay warm. Have a good meal now and then. Watch some good movies. Watch some bad movies. Watch a whole bunch of Hammer Horror films and just have a good time with them. And I'll catch you next time.